And I got to admit, I am so glad you reminded us about the Bolas' Citadel in the main deck for Shota. I'm really looking forward to this match. Yep. Let's head over to Becca to get the game started. Thanks so much, Day9. All right, I am so excited to see this match play out. Let's welcome to the stage the winner of the Mythic Championship one in Cleveland from this year and two-time England National Championship. A big welcome to Autumn Burchett. player, Hall of Famer, Deck Brewer, S for Control player, Shota Yasuoka. All right, let's throw it on over to Marshall Sutcliffe and Paul Chion taking over in the booth. Thank you, Becca. Welcome to the booth here. That's Paul Chiano, Marshall Suckliff. Thanks so much for coming along for your coverage of Mythic Championship 3 here from Las Vegas. And uh, boy, we've got one of the marquee matchups in the field. Now, there aren't that many people actually playing Nexus, only three in the entire field. But this is what they were gunning for, right? This is what they were hoping to see when they showed up. Yeah, absolutely. Coming into the event, I think the deck to beat was some variant of Esper, Esper Hero or Esper Control. And you know, one of the best strategies against that deck is by playing something that doesn't have a lot of creatures and just tries to go over the top. And that's exactly what the Simic Nexus deck is trying to do. That's right. And so we'll see this one play out in an interesting way as well. We've been talking a lot about the Nexus deck simply because of how well it's placed in this particular metagame. Had a chat with Simon Gertz and the other player, one of the other players playing the deck and uh, you know he felt like he really chose very well for this field and I'm sure that both uh, Emma and Autumn feel the same way. Yeah, although they are playing a slightly different build, they're playing actually yes. kind of the more traditional build of the Simic Nexus deck. Instead of playing Nissa, which is really, really strong at dealing with Planeswalkers, they're choosing to go with Wilderness Reclamation, which does make the deck a little more explosive in terms of just being able to go off with the Nexus of Fate. However, you know, you are playing in a field where there's Teferi Time Raveler all over the place. 40% of the field basically is playing Teferi Time Raveler. And when that's in play, Wilderness Reclamation just doesn't do a whole lot because of the static effect on Teferi, which prevents you from casting instants at instant speed. Mm -hmm. That's right. Only sorcery is allowed, of course, under that condition. Now, when it comes to metagaming, Shota also took a shot. Right, and you know, it, it appears that he tried to go a little bit bigger than the than the opposing Esper control decks that he expected to face by including those copies of Holus' Citadel. And look, it looks like Autumn Mulligan kept the one lander and has not been able to find land number two. And this is something that we saw in the previous match where they played. And um, you know, the, <laughs> Autumn is in a lot of trouble. Needs to hit those land drops to be able to ramp into those reclamations wow. and misses. Autumn peels a cold seven drop off the top of the library. That is not going to get the job done. Passes a turn back to Shota. And Shota is now going to continue to dismantle the hand of Autumn Burchett. This is Thought Erasure. Taking it away. Well, we've seen the two two drops disappear from the hand here, leaving just Callous Dismissal. Though, thankfully for Autumn, that is a land off the top of the library and, in fact, an island as well, though currently no castable spells at this point. So back to you, Shota. And uh, looks like Shota's got Basilica Bell Hunt or Teferi Time Raveler at the ready. And he's just going to be a man efficient here and go for the Bell Hunt. Here's an opt in response from Autumn. Nothing doing with that Wilderness Reclamation right back down to the bottom. And uh, a second copy of Tamiyo Collector of Tales. Doesn't look great here, although I guess if we're discarding a card. Yeah, and Shota here with just a beautiful curve here. Curving oh, Thought Erasure into Basilica Bell Hunt. Knows basically the coast is clear to then tap out to play a turn five to Fairy Hero Dominaria. And Autumn just really doesn't have a whole lot here because, I mean, frankly, Autumn has just been unable to find mana this game. And now all of a sudden, Shota's playing the beatdown role. He's got Basilica Bell Hunt on the offensive. And like you said, this curve out has just been absolutely brutal from Shoti Asoka. Now it's Teferi, Hero of Dominaria on the battlefield, sending search, search for his Kanta packing and perhaps Autumn's chances of winning this game as well. 
Yeah, I mean, this game is basically over no at this point. I think Autumn is just far too behind here. Showed us, you know, drawing multiple cards every turn. Even has Command the Dread Horde to get some stuff out of the yard. Just way too much going on. And of course, we I had talked about earlier how powerful Teferi Time Raveler is in this matchup. Just being able to prevent the opponent from casting, you know, floating mana with Wilderness Reclamation and then firing off those Nexus of Fates. Burn spells now from Shota. <laughs> this is not the normal mode of play for uh, for the Japanese Hall of Famer here. Oath of Kaya, your face. But life totals are falling very quickly here for Autumn. Keep up the pace. And uh, yeah, just a uh, pretty simple story here in game number one. Uh, kept a one lander, wasn't able to get there, and Autumn is uh, basically relegated to a uh, spectator here. Absolutely. And this is a common play that you'll see. Teferi Time Raveler synergizing very well with Oath of Kaya. Oath of Kaya very good at protecting your Planeswalkers, but also Teferi can bounce Oath of Kaya to allow you to kind of get an additional uh, trigger from that card. That's right. We've seen that quite a bit. And there's another Oath of Kaya off the top of the library, and that signifies game number one. Heading right to Shota Yasuoka, so easy mode for him to get things started in this match with a really non-competitive game number one. But that does, of course, mean that we get to transition to sideboards now. And this is where things get really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we saw a very similar thing happened in the previous round where Autumn played against Paula Vitor, where, yeah, Paula just kind of won that first game, but then Autumn kind of was able to string things together in games two and three with kind of the creature plan here, co combining both Thorn Lieutenant and Biogenic Ooze to just provide a different angle of attack. And this really puts a lot of pressure on Shota. Now Shota has to play the mind game, try to figure out, all right, are you going to bring in the creatures? And if you do, how much removal do I need to keep in? Because, you know, you can just sequence things in such a way where you draw your removal and your opponents don't draw the creatures, or you don't draw your removal and all of a sudden a Biogenic Ooze runs away with the game. Yeah, I'm curious to see if Shota is actually going to leave in uh, the copies, you know, his sweepers, right. basically. I see one of them right there at the very, very top of your screen. You can see he's got at least one copy of Kaya's Wrath still in there currently, though. We're still under in sideboarding, so who knows? Yeah, it looks like um, Autumn is actually choosing to side out a lot of their cantrip or card draw effects. You see Chemister's Insight being sideboarded out along with an Opt, and I think that's kind of a concession to Narset being such a powerful card in this matchup. So take, take a look at this. There is still two copies of Kaya's Wrath there in the main deck for Shota currently, and he does have it down to 60 cards, so this could be what we're going to see. Yeah, a lot more removal in, in this configuration than what we saw from Martin Yuza, keeping all the, sorry, uh, Paulo Vitor, yep. keeping the Kaya's Wrath along with the multiple copies of Cast Down. Boarding out Commander Dreadhorde because Commander Dreadhorde doesn't have a whole lot of targets on Autumn's side of the battlefield, but choosing to keep Bolas to Citadel because, you know, outside of the six or seven creatures Autumn brings in, you know, there's not a lot of pressure that the Simic deck is able to apply to the Esper deck. Boy, Autumn's just kind of having the run of it here. <clears throat> Another mulligan, this time with Lance, though. So we see Blink of an Eye and a Thorn Lieutenant, a pretty mediocre opening hand here for Autumn Burchett. However, Narset is a tremendous card to have Ooh. on top. It's a three mana card. You can curve into it. Now you can curve Thorn Lieutenant into Narset, and Narset will able to dig and find you two additional cards. Oh, yeah. Nice draw there. Definitely what we wanted to see on top of the library for sitting in Autumn's seat. So here comes Narset, Harder of Veils. Ooh, got some choices here, too. Another Narset, an Opt, or a Tamiyo Collector of Tales. The curve looks nice here. Two, three, four off of a hand that looked like it didn't have a lot of action. Can't complain about that. And big draw from Shota. Really needed a Black Source there. Mm. Keeping an opening hand with Hallowed Fountain, Glacial Fortress, Plains with a bunch of hand disruption spells in hand. So now he does have the ability to play that Thought Erasure this turn to get that Tamiyo out of Autumn's hand. with only one black mana source, that duress is no longer part of the equation. Also, Bolas' Citadel <laughs> looks a little far away at this point, but right. that wasn't really the plan at this point anyway. Narset yeah. is going to garner that second card of card advantage thanks to the minus ability. Blink of an eye goes into the hand here for Autumn Burchett. Land number four hits, but again, Tamiyo in the graveyard already thanks to Thought Erasure last turn. And that's going to leave Autumn with, well, not a whole, whole lot going on here this turn. Just attack for two and pass. Yeah, Shota really wanted another Black Source there just to run up Basilica Bellhaunt, mm. as it would do an excellent job of just kind of keeping that Thorn Lieutenant at bay. So now he's going to start whittling away at the blink of an eyes in, uh, in hand here for Autumn by using 
duress to take it away and then cast a copy of Narset Parter of Veils of his own. The good news for Narset is that she doesn't actually draw you cards properly, so you can still get your cards off of this minus ability, even facing down an opposing Narset. And there's a Kaya's Wrath, and that's a notable piece of information for Autumn on multiple levels. Not right. only do they know about it in hand right now, but also, all right, so you kept at least one in. Uh, look at all the value that Autumn's getting there. Casting Narset, getting two cards, and then end of turn using Blink of an Eye to bounce it. Although didn't get to draw the, wait no, did get to draw the card because that was end of turn. Narset's static ability saying you can only, you cannot draw more than one card on each of your turns. That's right. And Autumn's going to go for the super efficient play here. They have the option to take one of two powerful cards and decided to go for the cheaper of the two, Search yeah. for Escanta, because they can play it right now. Yeah, Search for Escanta is extremely difficult for the Esper control deck to, to deal with because, you know, we've seen a shift in the metagame where they just don't play Mortify anymore. So they don't actually have a clean way to remove Search for Escanta. Sure, you can bounce it with Teferi, uh, with both Teferis, but you can't actually remove it from the battlefield. Yeah, we usually see some combination of bounce plus, well, thought erasure. <laughs> Thank you, Shota. And Shota, after having seen the hand, says, I've seen enough of this hand disruption. Puts a duress from the top of the library in, in the graveyard, thanks to Surveil, passes the turn back to Autumn. Yeah, and that was a big find off the Narset as well, because Shota now had the opportunity, if he did find some black sources. Oh, it looks like he's pretty far away, actually. He only has one in play. But if he does find a couple black sources, he can slam down that Bolas to Citadel. Right, and it's still at 16 life, as Autumn has been directing Thorn Lieutenant over to the Planeswalkers means that uh, Bolas' Citadel could be extremely powerful play for Shota, but it does look like it's a bit too far away at this point. His mana really punishing him here. Right, and Autumn does have the ability this turn to run out Nexus of Fate, but I don't even think that they're going to go for it. I think they're just happy with just, you know, attacking with Thorn Lieutenant every turn and just keeping up Negate. It's just not really that exciting, right? Exactly. It's, it's, it's too damaged in a card at this point. Yeah, you really want to maximize a Nexus of Fate with a way to kind of get ahead on cards. Mm -hmm. If you have a Planeswalker on the battlefield, if you have Wilderness Reclamation with Chemistry's Insight, you need things like that to really kind of capitalize on that extra turn that you're getting from Nexus of Fate. Autumn didn't look super excited about negating that Narset, but with another copy of Negate in hand, they were like, yeah, sure. Yeah, not only that, just casting, firing off more spells does ma mean that Autumn gets one step closer to mm. flipping that Search for Escanta, Absolutely. because once you do flip Search for Escanta, that kind of, you know, if that's in play for a couple of turns, it's a lot like having Teferi here of Dominari in play. Once you have that Planeswalker in play for a couple of turns, I mean, there's just no coming back from all that card advantage. Well, Autumn is going to fire off Nexus of Fate now, and that's because there's actually a lot more going on on the other side of the battlefield. Autumn gets to cast Narset, also gets to transform Search for Iskanta. And it's going to definitely garner some value here. Here comes Narset. And what does the plan look like from Shota's seat? Well, Shota has to fight through that negate. He doesn't know about this, this copy, I don't think. At least I don't think he does. But, you know, he's going to have to just eventually find an answer for Thorn Lieutenant. Autumn has a ton of lands in play now, so that Thorn Lieutenant is now becoming a real threat. Because early on, turn two, it doesn't really do a whole no, lot, right? It looks two at a time, ex Exactly. But, but now we're at the point where Autumn has, you know, ten lands in play. So now, you know, every turn can threaten, you know, six chunks of life at a time. And right now, Shota's sitting at 12 life. That's a two-turn clock. I have to say, that Thorn Lieutenant, having sat on the battlefield for this long, has actually done a lot of work, killed multiple Planeswalkers, and take a decent chunk out of Shota's life total. So even though turn two, it's like, well, okay, Thorn Lieutenant, I'll deal with that at some point. It's actually done a lot of good work. And now look at this. Biogenic Ooze plus Nexus of Fate in hand. We're getting really close to Autumn being able to try to set up a situation where a resolved Nexus of Fate with any type of board state here could get the job done. Yeah, Autumn firmly in the lead here. Shota's mana not doing him any favors this game. Only has that one black source, and as you can take a look at his hand, he's got a bunch of double and triple black spells in hand. I am going to cast Wilderness Reclamation. Okay. And you heard Autumn announce verbally that they were going to cast Wilderness Reclamation, and this is so that Shota has the opportunity to set the stops properly. Right. Yeah, because if you do not set the stops properly on Arena, it will, all uh, the Wilderness Reclamation trigger will happen I immediately, even if you did have an answer. So if Shota has something like a D Spark, it does give, if Shota, Shota sets the stop, has the opportunity to cast D Spark before Wilderness Reclamation triggers. That's right. 
And Shota said, okay. And then Autumn put next fade on the stack, and Shota said, okay, I'm done. <laughs> That's <laughs> enough. We're going to move on to game number three. And once again, we get to do this dance, right? The question is, what were the cards that each player saw that were relevant to their sideboard plans? And again, one of the big ones was that Autumn got a chance to see at least one Kaya's Wrath. And then on the other side, you know, does Shota know about the creature sideboard plan that Autumn could bring into play here with these biogenic ooze, of which they have three copies currently sideboarded in. And of course, Shota will have seen that Thorn Lieutenant and assume that the other ones will come along with that as well. Yeah, the Biogenic Ooze is the much more exciting card. That Biogenic Ooze, if left, you know, kind of in, unchecked, just can just win the game in two or three turns. We yeah. saw the Thorn Lieutenant, it takes a little more time. Yeah. I mean, the nice thing about Thorn Lieutenant is you kind of get under counter magic and it's just a cheap threat. But Biogenic Ooze is the card that really allows you to just kind of take over the game right away. Yeah, an answer this or lose. Exactly. And it, it also, of course, works really well with Nexus to Fate because each attack is lethal. It just gets yeah. lethal so quickly. Exactly. Also works very well with Wilderness Reclamation. Oh, that is disgusting, <laughs> by the way. Like, yeah. I, the first time uh, somebody did that against me, I'm like, wait, what is going on here? And it's like there's oozes flying all over right. the battlefield. I'm like, okay, I lose, fine. All right, game number three is upon us. This time, of course, it will be Shota Yasoka on the play, kicks things off with a Drowned Catacomb, passes a turn back. To Autumn, who's got an opt available, and again, just not the opening hands haven't really been cooperating with Autumn, although they have been able to draw out of it quite cleanly, thanks to cards like opt in part. Oh, there's the biogenic goose right. we were just yeah, talking probably about. Probably keeping that. Yeah, it's some action. This is a very threat heavy hand with double Nexus of Fate biogenic goose. The big hitters are here, but nothing to do in between. Right, and Shota with that awkward hand where. Didn't have a shock land hand, no Hallowed Fountain, no Watery Grave, so just he's kind of a turn behind for, for all of his plays. You see that Thought Erasure being played on turn three instead of two, and you know, that's kind of the, the sacrifice that you have to play sometimes when you do play a three color deck where you only have, you know, 12 or 13 ways to kind of uh, synergize with your, your, your check lands. Yeah, well, I mean, you want, you want double blue on turn three, you want triple black <laughs> at some point. I suppose it's not exactly turn six, right? But. You want to play Narset into. Basilica Belhaunt. Yes. It's a very ambitious fan of <laughs> It's really rough. And as we see here, uh, you mentioned it, Paul. Uh, Shota is being punished for this with tap land, tap land, tap land, tap land. So pretty brutal. All right. Narset Parter Veils hits the battlefield. Yeah, one nice addition to the Simic Nexus stack is the addition of Blast Zone because, you know, cards like Narset and Teferi are just so backbreaking in the matchup, but now you can just kind of play two lands into your deck for almost free to give you that answer to cards like Narset. And the thing is, you know, the, the worst card in the match, the best card in the matchup against you are both Narset and Teferi, and, you know, you can kind of use this one land to kill both of them in one fell swoop. All right, this is getting really interesting, Paul, because what we've seen is that time gap here from Autumn has really given Shota a chance to dominate this battlefield currently. So the big question is, has he built up enough of an advantage to overcome what is going to be a string of pretty nice plays here for Autumn as well, starting off with Biogenic Ooze next turn? Yeah, Autumn's going to fire off Biogenic Ooze. However, this time, Shota does have the answer. He has a D spark in hand. So what he can do is, you know, Biogenic Ooze uh, enters a battlefield, trigger on the stack or whatever. You can use the D spark to get the Biogenic Ooze off the table before that end step trigger happens, which puts plus one, plus one counters on all, all of Autumn's oozes. So then it, we, we're left with just a two two. Just a two two, okay. exactly. And then Cameo Collector of Tales could come down, but that's a little slow at that point. But then we could see Nexus of Fate start getting chained. The question is, can Teferi keep up? And right now, the hand looks pretty decent here for Shota, stacked with spells, just one Godless Shrine left. Yeah, I don't think Autumn's in a position to just run out Tamiyo here. I think Autumn no. really wants to play out an ooze right. to put pressure on the Planeswalkers that are in play. I think they kind of just have to. Though, as you can see... Autumn is also suspicious that this will be successful. They don't know about the D-Spark in hand. Right. But assumptions are probably being made uh, And it looks like Autumn's going for Tamiyo here. This All does right. this does mean that the duress in Shota's hand will be turned off unless Shota chooses to use D-Spark mm -hmm. to get that uh, Tamiyo off the battlefield. Catalog. Right, which probably will happen, but that does leave Biogenic Ooze to run rampant if, uh, if Shota doesn't find an answer out of the next probably six cards in right. <laughs> this library. 
All right, so Opt back in hand. And let's see if Shota wants to use his mana here. He has so much to do. Next turn, he can play yeah. Teferi Time Raveler, he can play Duress, and he can play Search for Escanta. It just unlocks so much to be able to use your mana up here and, of course, the Duress coming online now. And he's so likely to find an answer to Biogenic yeah. I mean, he already has that Teferi Time Raveler and Hero of Dominaria in play right. as well. So you just want to use your mana. And Oath of Kaya, also an answer, at least for the first turn, that Biogenic hits play. Wilderness Reclamation seen off of Opt here for Autumn. Will they keep it? So this is really interesting. Yes. So there's a... We're going to see Teferi Time Raveler hit play, which does kind of shut off Wilderness Reclamation. However, Autumn has the Blast Zone on three. So Autumn does have the ability to sacrifice Blast Zone to get both Narset and Teferi Time Raveler off the battlefield. Boy, that is such a game swinging play too. Blast Zone so often is just a mana, you know, just, just makes a colorless mana. But the times when it's good, it's like, wow. Oh, it looks like, never mind. It looks like Autumn chose to bin the Wilderness Reclamation. Ah, OK. OK. I thought they were going to go for the play Wilderness Reclamation. Or, or is that what he took? Was, wasn't it? Oh, I thought it was on. Oh, Duress. Of course. Okay, of okay. Opt, that's what happened. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was in hand. That's mad respect for Wilderness oh, Reclamation. Oh, right. It was, it was an opt. I thought it was a, a scry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now let's get back in the tank here with Autumn Burchett because things are getting very intense on the battlefield. And the decision here lies between the Blast Zone and the Biogenic Ooze. Timing, options, it, do you just, are you just forced to use the, the Blast Zone at this point, Paul? Yeah, but it's just so awkward because then you're like, you're, you're a mana off from starting to kind of chain the Nexus of Fates together. Uh, However, Nexus of Fate on an empty board also just doesn't do a whole lot. Sure. So I think it looks like Autumn is willing to give Shota the card from Teferi Time Raveler because Shota can choose to use the minus ability. Oh no, it looks like we're seeing not. draw step here. Interesting. Okay, away go the two three mana Planeswalkers and Blast Zone. So those are gone. But of course, if you're sitting in Shota's seat, you're not really crying. You've got Teferi Hero of Dominaria in your hand already and a replacement Narset at the ready as well. Absolutely. Shota's in fantastic shape here still. Yeah, you know, it was that lapse in the uh, little middle part of the game there where Autumn just didn't have any action, right? right? It was a couple of ops and then sitting around for a little while, hoping to get up to Biogenic Ooze and Tamiyo, but that two two turn gap, Shota was casting stuff. Right. There's a Narset off the top of the library now for Autumn. And it looks like uh, Shota choosing not to cast Discovery, keeping up mana to cast dis the Dispersal half potentially. <laughs> Uh, which bounces the uh, most expensive permanent on your, uh, on your opponent's side and then makes them discard a card. That's right. Of note, not that card, but a card. Right, a card on the opposing side. Yeah. If you can get them down to no cards in hand, you can, you know, get right. their most expensive thing, but uh, that's not going to happen here. All right. Now what, says Autumn. Well... Looks like we're going to kick off the festivities with Narset Parter of Veils. Yeah, now the pressure is on Autumn. Autumn needs to find a way to kind of take over this game because Teferi is a, is a ticking time bomb here. He's currently sitting at 7. Shota has the backup Teferi, so he can fire off the emblem even when it hits 8 instead of 9 and start eating, whittling away at Autumn's lands. Yeah, Autumn needs to find a blink of an eye to try to slow down that Teferi ultimate, and they did not. Wilderness Reclamation, a potentially powerful option here with double Nexus of Fate and a Biogenic Ooze, but the question is, is Autumn too far behind at this point to make that plan work? You know, and the, the really tough part, if you're sitting in Autumn's seat, is that, you know, as Teferi marches his way upwards to towards the ultimate, it's just more cards hitting the hand, and that's an opportunity for more hand disruption spells, counters, or anything to interact with that game plan, which is looking very fragile at this point, though I don't believe that Autumn really has another option. And Let's see here. Should have just piling on the card advantage here. Yeah, and there's that Thought Erasure. Yeah, now with Teferi, we're going to see an instant speed draw step Thought Erasure here from Shota. Feels bad, man, as Feels they say very in the bad. business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, this is, uh, this is one of the cute interactions that you get from playing Teferi. Time Raveler, one of the many. And now we're going to see a draw step, and there it is, Thought Erasure. Let's see what you're working with. And as you can see, Autumn has Double Nexus of Fate, Biogenic Ooze, and a Wilderness Reclamation to choose from. So, so I, you know, I think, how do you break this down? I think the, the, the most likely way for Shota to lose here is by letting Autumn have that Wilderness Reclamation. Well, however, actually, no, there's a Narset and Teferi in play, too. There's a, lot, right. there's a lot that Autumn needs to fight through here. Yeah. But, but it, looks like, it looks like he's going for the, uh, the Wilderness Reclamation. That's right. How much mana does he have available? Just two. Yeah, and th this is not a great Nexus of Fate. It's just right. Nexus of Fate on an empty board. Autumn gets another turn, but really just needs to string together this is huge. a lot of powerful cards. They need and to it's find gonna some be real action. tough. Yeah, and Breeding Pool off the top of the library does not get it done. And what often happens here is you're forced to cast the other Nexus of Fate for no value. This, these are, <laughs> yeah. for those of you, this is cycling. <laughs> yeah, well, the upside here of firing off the second Nexus of Fate, <laughs> now, now Autumn has the ability to <laughs> Did play. Did you see Autumn smile? Yeah, I saw <laughs> the like, smirk. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, Autumn, uh, Autumn now has the ability to play Biogenic Ooze and actually make a token now mm. because Autumn is now at nine lands. But it looks like Autumn wants to just keep taking all of the turns here. And finally, runs out of gas with an island off the top of the library. But the trio of Planeswalkers on the side of Shotiasa Oka. Critically, Teferi Hero of Dominaria sitting at eight loyalty. Yeah, and this is not going to get it done this time around. Biogenic Ooze was really impressive in the previous match, but Shota's in full control. Control. He's got that Teferi on eight. It's going to emblem. Then we can draw a card off to Fairy Time. Oh, are we going to see that? I just, I, I just want I to see want it get to, cast, Paul, honestly. I really want to. I don't know if it's correct to do so at all. <laughs> it is yes. correct to do so. All right, Bolas' Citadel hits the battlefield. And look at all Autumn. Right, here we go. <laughs> Autumn's like, OK, cool, whatever. <laughs> Let the man have his fun. Yeah. And here is another copy of Narset and a land. So now Shota can bounce the, one of he the has tokens. Thought Erasure now on top. He's at 14 life, so plenty to work with here. Don't worry, I got this. But as you mentioned, bounce a token and then exile something. Probably Memorial to Genius or the 3 3. Also, Shota can just cast Discovery to draw an additional card to deal with another threat. Wow, Schultz is like, this is exactly how I drew this up when I was <laughs> practicing at home. And now he gets to do it at the Mythic Championship level. Just living the dream here. I mean, to be fair, Bolas' Citadel is very strong when you're gold fishing, right? That is you know, true. You're just yeah. playing by yourself. It's like, that oh, wow, true. I get to draw lots of cards with this if my opponents don't do anything. No. Look at this. Oath of Kai is free. Mm. Pay it for free, get the life back. Yep, free burn spells. That's right. You're down three, I'm at the same. And there is even more. A Thought Erasure off the top of the library, which could potentially clear away some room for some <laughs> more spells. And there's Discovery Dispersal. Again, as you mentioned, Paul, every one of these discoveries is also exiling a land at this point. This turn is completely ridiculous in favor of Shoti yeah. Asahoka, is who smart. is uh, whittling away the permanent count here for Autumn Burchett. I mean, to be fair, Shoto is probably going to win with just the Teferi, but, mm -hmm. you know, get to add a, a little more style points here yeah. by trying to win with the Bolas Citadel. Just, just the customary ultimate Teferi play Teferi. Right, right. exactly. <laughs> All right, and Autumn says, that's enough of that. Shota Yasaoka takes the match. Two games, 2-1 two, here in the third round. So great work from Shota as he continues his march upwards. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we saw kind of Autumn really just... S very, very subpar opening hands in yes. all of the games. Really and rough draws. Was, for was able to scrap and, and, and take one of those. But I mean, just, you know, the ideal start for that deck is, you know, Opt or Growth Spiral into a Tamiyo or Wilderness Reclamation. And Autumn never had a start like that. And I think, you know, by the time they went to game three, they're just like, look, I got four lands in my hand and some spells. I'm going to keep and just hope to get there. <laughs> yeah. And of course, yeah. that's, that's one of those things where, again, there was just this window, right? It was like first few turns, there was some action, a little bit of hand disruption, and then there 
there was this window where Shota acted and Autumn did not, and Autumn could never come back from it. Yeah, and the one last card I want to talk about is Bolas Citadel, which is just absolutely backbreaking. It's fantastic against these decks that don't have a lot of creatures that don't pressure life total. So in this specific matchup against all those different Simic decks, I mean, I think that's going to be an all-star. Yeah, absolutely. And it was fun to see it on camera. Hopefully we'll see more. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll have more magic right after this. We'll see you then. Abby, but down to two life. That will do it. I am Andrea Mengucci, I'm from Italy. I am 25 and I'm a professional magic player. Since I was a kid, like I started playing magic at the beach. It's basically been the only game that I've been playing. I was a really, really good at sports, so I was just more like playing on the computer, but always magic. You just became the first champion of the Magic Invitation! So I finished my study last year and I was like, okay, great. 2019 will be my professional year. I'll be playing professionally magic. Hi, I'm Martin Uzo. I'm from the Czech Republic, and I play a lot of Magic. In high school, my friends were playing this interesting game, and I just, you know, I was interested, so I asked them what, what it is, and it's this, you know, cool strategy game, and, like, before I knew it, I was buying packs and just, like, had a, had a huge collection and everything, and, like, and as the time went by, I started playing tournaments and went to PTQs and whatever, and, and now we're here. When I got the phone call, it was an exciting moment. It was just, like, you know, there's a lot of things running through your head, and you're, like, Oh, we finally made it. This is great. This is all we ever wanted. My name is Luis Salvato. I'm from Argentina. The first time my brother bought some portal decks. We learn how to play, and then 10 years ago, I'm playing professional level. Faxon says that's enough to kill me. Luis Salvato <laughs> is your. My family and my friends support me a lot. When I found out that I was in the MPL, that I was selected for that, everyone, mostly me, was super excited about this. My name is William Jensen, nicknamed Huey, and I'm here today because I'm a member of the Magic Pro League. I first started playing Magic in 1997. It didn't take me very long to become competitive and start going to tournaments. I was going to weekly tournaments on, on a couple weeknights a week and even Saturdays, and I really liked the, the atmosphere, and I definitely found somewhere where I felt like I belonged. And welcome back to coverage here of the Mythic Championship 3 from Las Vegas. That's Paul Chiano, Marshall Sackler. Thanks so much for coming along for coverage here of round number three. We've got more magic lined up for you here where we have the big nasty. Big nasty. Matt Nass. And uh, he's playing against Ashley Espinosa. That's Muffin Pastry Pie for those of you that watch her stream. And let's get into the action right away here. Boom. Oh, we're right into the action here. No joke. Yeah, and it looks like we have Esper Control going up against Gruel. So who is happy when they sat down? Uh, you know, I think I think Matt's happy, especially with this configuration of uh, the Esper. Mm -hmm. He has access to the Kaya's Wrath, which is very, very strong in this matchup. And it really just kind of depends on the configuration of, of Muffin Pie, just like how many sticky threats uh, is she playing in her deck. So cards like Rekindling Phoenix do a lot of work, especially against cards like Kaya's Wrath, or even cards like Nissa, who shakes the world that you see in her graveyard, right? If that was a Skargan Hellkite, for example, Matt Nass would be much happier because he has a lot more clean answers to that. And you see clean answer here. That's D-Spark there from Matt Nass, one of the cleanest ways to get rid of a rekindling Phoenix. And part of the reason why it isn't as popular as it once was, there are now options on getting rid of it much more permanently than before. Now Matt is going to have to chain together a combination of Cast Down plus, plus Kaya's Wrath at some point if he wants to get rid of it, unless he can find a cleaner answer. Yeah, and it looks like 
Ashley is aware of the Kaya's Wraths in Matt Nass's hand yeah, here. She's seen both of them. So, so you know, she's definitely going to kind of play it slow here, not run out that Gruul Spellbreaker in her hand. And just kind of pressure Matt's life total. Attack for five at a time. Doesn't need to really worry about Narset Parter Veils. The Gruul deck doesn't draw cards. He's drawing cards anyway, right? Exactly. It's really hard to find time to draw cards when you're beating face. It's just yeah. not in the schedule. Matt might need to kind of... My, my, Matt might be forced to just cast cast down end of turn and then follow that up with a Kaya's Wrath. It yeah. feels very bad, but he might want to do that because you know now he's getting to kind of a low enough life total where Ashley could start top decking some burn spells to finish off Matt Ness. Yeah, he. Th this is the window, right? right? He he waited the one turn to see if he could get a little bit of extra value or find a cleaner answer. He did not, so he is finally going to bite the bullet here. This of course does mean though that Ashley's just going to say, well, yeah, your move. She's definitely not going to run an additional creature into the Kaya's Wrath here. Has to turn back here to Matt, who really has set up this play. Nothing else he could do. Kaya's Wrath to get rid of the one card. So that's a two for one going in the direction of Muffin Pastry Pie. Ooh, and Growth Chamber Guardian with a lot of mana available as well. Yeah, Means that's that it. She can afford to just start putting out singleton threats. Yeah, that's a the, huge draw. For the rest of the game. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I would have probably played that Stomping Ground first um, because if, oh no, never mind. Matt Nass has a Kaya's Wrath that she knows about. But if Matt Nass had something like a cast down in hand, you want to make sure that you have access to the mana to adapt in response to removal spell, just so that you can make sure you get that additional copy of Growth Chamber Guardian. But given that we know Matt Nass has Kai's Wrath in hand, that does not matter. And, th and that was big. That was big for Matt Nass finding that search for Escanta to just find a continuous source of card advantage here. He needed that. He, he needed that. But keep in mind, though, Ashley still has Domri. Domri's static is just highly, highly effective. Your entire team gets plus one, plus zero. And, uh, you know, Matt is... There's going to be a ton of pressure next turn because, you know, Ashley now has the ability to shock Matt Nass down to nine. Gruul Spellbreaker can, will have haste, but still have that additional power, so, so will still cool. be a four power threat. And that Growth Chamber Guardian still needs to be dealt with, too. That's right. And, and that is why Matt is respecting each and every threat that Ashley's putting on the battlefield at this point, because even though it looks like he's at a reasonable life total at 11, he knows about Gruul Spellbreaker in hand. And that could be a big issue. And it looks like she's going to pounce here, facing down Matt Nass. I love it. No cards in hand she says i am going to get in for four right now and force you to find an answer it is difficult even with search for his canta to line up everything just right and the window's going to close very quickly here on matt yeah and going for the main phase activation to play around instant speed removal and matt needs to find a re uh, another sweeper here another removal spell that is godless shrine so in search for his canta or in this case the sunken ruin Matt trusts. Can he find something to get out of this mess? He's going to need to find multiple somethings, but he has to have one right now. Kaya's Wrath, anybody? Needs Kaya's Wrath number three. There it oh, is! Okay. Kaya's Wrath to keep him in the game, though I will say he's still pretty far behind that Growth Chamber Guardian. Yeah, absolutely. But that was stage one, for sure. Now the question is how many more Growth Chamber Guardians are in Ashley's deck? Does she have another one? Okay, so hey, now Matt is in position here, right? He's got Ascanta the Sunken Ruin and a ton oh of mana in play. He <laughs> might be able to turn it around now. That was huge. Oh, he, Teferi Time Raveler. That'll buy him some time. Absolutely. Keep in mind, he only has three Kaya's Wraths in his deck. <laughs> We've seen him. Another thing to keep in mind, of course, is that shock in Muffin Pastry Pie's hand. It does represent lethal in combination with Domri and a Growth Chamber Guardian, so he is walking a very fine line here, but seemingly hanging in there. Yeah, coming back slowly here. He really just wants Ashley to whiff for a couple of turns here, and he will be able to take over the game with Escanta the Sunken Ruin. Maybe find some life gain sources, Oath of Kaya, Basilica That's what Belhans, I was just thinking, cards right? like right. that. You know, it's like once you get one problem solved, you start solving the, <laughs> the less urgent problems, but being at seven, ooh, Skargan oh. Hellkite, that cast down. That's lethal. That is lethal. That is actually. lethal. Yes. Because now that's two five power attackers along with the shock with in the her shock. hand. <laughs> Matt has the answer to cast down, but that was the perfect draw for Ashley. Wow, what a top oh, deck here. Oh my goodness. For Ashley Espinoza, she's going to send in two. Well, this is a lethal Look at attack. Look this shock in response. Up, and then shock in response. Yeah. 
Boom! Oh Upstairs, and, and he is Matt not happy. says, I should have bounced that growth chamber guardian. Oh, wow. Oh, what a beating. Matt Nass takes the loss here. Muffin Pastry Pie gets things done. She had him on the ropes for multiple turns since we joined this game on turn three, and she finally delivered the knockout punch, picking up game number one. Yeah, as you mentioned, Matt did have the option of minusing Teferi there just to bounce the Grow Chamber Guardian and keep up the cast down. And it seems like that might have been just the, the more prudent play because every turn that you're you play it a little bit safer, you still get that additional card from Ascanza the Sunken Ruin. That's right. And of course, you know, you and I were starting to switch our gaze towards, well, <laughs> is there a, a life gain spell in here somewhere? Like, right. you know, seven was a very uncomfortable life total against most of the threats that Muffin Pastry Pie could bring to the table, so. Yeah, and it looks like Ashley is playing the Gruel, Ver Gruel deck that has Immortal Sun in the main with a third copy in the sideboard here. So Immortal Sun, extremely powerful against a deck full of Planeswalkers. However, the Esper mid-range or control decks have all kind of adjusted their decks, where now they have multiple ways to deal with the Immortal Sun. You often see people boarding in two to three copies of D-Spark as answers to the Immortal Sun. That's not to say that the card is still not effective. You can still set it up. You can still... A must answer. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two in the main, one in the board for, yeah. for Muffin Pastry Pie. And just does so much work because you're already a creature-based deck. It pumps your entire team. Like, every line of text on that card is just actually very strong. Yeah, that's the one thing that it's it's easy to remember the part about the Planeswalkers when you're thinking about playing against this particular deck, but it does a lot else too. Right, just the fact that it, it's kind of basically like its own Planeswalker. Yeah. It gets you an additional card every single turn while pumping your entire team. All right, game number two incoming here. Will the assault from Muffin Pastry Pie continue or will Matt Nass use his presumably superior sideboard plan? You know, these con these uh, three-color control decks seem to be able to fine-tune their deck beautifully for any matchup. We'll see if he can leverage that advantage here. Wow. Awkward start. Yeah, no untapped green source here for Muffin. So we're going to see no Llanowar Elves hit the battlefield until turn number two. And boy, a turn two Legion War Boss is just what you want. And unfortunately, that's not going to be the case here potentially giving Matt some time to stabilize this board. He's going to kick things off with the Duress, and he does actually find a target for it, so that's good. <laughs> Sees uh, Nissa there. Ooh, and, and given that Matt Nass drew Cry of the Carnarium, he might just choose to play a land tapped because he's not going to use cast down anyways to try to get Ashley Dude. to play Legion Warboss over Gruul Spellbreaker. He's totally doing and that. And then play Cry of the Carnarium. <laughs> and it, this is going to work out beautifully for me. He's totally doing that. <laughs> and it's going to work out really nicely. He does take a couple of damage here, but he says, yeah. you fell into my trap. He's got that value here. Yep. And that is the name of the game. Got to get that Val. So Cry of the Carnarium is going to send the whole board packing. Another tap land here for Nass. Now, he is getting a little low on resources. Two removal spells left in hand, but he'd love to see a Planeswalker at this point, something to start generating advantage for him going down the line here. And if, you, if you're wondering why Ashley went for the plus one, plus one counter on the Gruul Spellbreaker, uh, that's that's a, in response to Oath of Kaya being a very, you know, three up to three copies of that card is played in the Esper control deck. So you want to make sure that your creatures can survive that by, and so as a result, you want to put that extra counter. However, that does leave you vulnerable to not dealing any damage and getting, you know, uh, kind of punished by cards like Cast Down. So interesting here, here's Nissa who shakes the world. One of the worst things for Matt to see on the battlefield and one of the best for Muffin Pastry Pie, but he does have answers in hand. So Nissa will not run away with the game as she so often does. Yeah, but now Matt has a, a variety of things that he needs to answer yes, here. Yes, yes. He's got Nissa that he needs to deal with. And then he's also got Grow Chamber Guardian and Skargan Hellkite. So he does need to find lots of answers here. I mean, he does have a D-Spark for the Nissa. He does have Ixalan's Binding for the Hellkite, but still. Yeah, yeah, but the Growth Chamber Guardian's legitimately a problem going down the line. Let's see what he can find here. Maybe it's best to, well, we'll see what Muffin Pastry Pie does, but uh, I don't know, Ixalan's Binding on Growth Chamber Guardian might be like if he could see everything, right? That might be the Ooh, best thing. Ooh, I think do. We're, we might just see a cast down on the forest here to try to keep uh, Ashley off of land number five. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's killing a threat as well, right? Exactly. It's, it's not just that. So, kill your land. Is there a land on top of the library here for Ashley? No, but it's a nice one. 
And uh, that was a no Man, hesitation. Man kind of wants to land here. Land would be nice. Yes. Okay, so now he has the ability to play Ixalan's Binding on the Phoenix, which is a really clean answer to that creature, and still has access to mana to activate Ascanth of the Sunken Ruin. All right, this is a great game, just uh, back and forth between both players. Right now, the way that it's going to play out is it's the hand of Ashley versus this, the uh, Ascanth of the Sunken Ruin on the other side. And the question is, oh, and oh, rekindling Phoenix. Should have used the binding. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that would have gone much better for Matt Nass, but instead, she gets to just windmill. And once again, though, we're going to see a similar play pattern as before, where Matt gets to activate as Kenta and also take care of the rekindling Phoenix with the binding, though. He is minorly punished there. And there's land number five off the top of the library there for Espinosa, and she says, well, I can use up my five mana one of two ways, and she's going to go for the Growth Chamber Guardian. Yeah, this, this makes a lot of sense. Matt Ness has Narset in hand, so he doesn't have the instant speed removal, and Ashley just wants to guarantee that she gets that extra card off Growth Chamber Guardian. And that's exactly what happened. So Growth Chamber Guardian into hand and on the battlefield here for Ashley. She passes to turn back to Nass, who did find Narset, Narset Parter of Veils last turn off of as Kanta, so he does have the ability to at least start to get some more card advantage going, though Narset doesn't really shine in this matchup like she does in some of the others that we've seen on camera. Right. I mean, I think things still are... Still a good card. Yeah, and I think things are still looking pretty good here for Matt Nass. You know, he's at a pretty healthy life total. Yeah. He's... He, he has multiple ways to kind of dig for answers here. He found that Dottie Razor to deal with the Hellkite or the Growth Chamber Garden if he wants. So he, as long as Ashley doesn't, you know, draw back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back threats, he's in pretty good shape because he's basically getting an additional card every turn. So what does he do here? He takes away the Growth Chamber Guardian to stem that bleeding. So now that little uh, stream of card advantage is shut down, and this is where, of course, the lands start coming off the top of the library here if you're Ashley. And the thing is, Ashley is not in a position where she's ahead enough to just kind of sandbag her creatures. Right. I think she just needs to run out the Hellkite, hope my opponent doesn't draw a Sweeper here, maybe, maybe kill that Narset so you have a less chance of finding a Sweeper, or you can just put your pressure, uh, the pedal to the metal here, two just turn put maximum clock. pressure <laughs> yeah. and just go, you know what, I'm going to put you on a two-turn clock. But I like her play here. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense, but, you know, this deck is full of answers. That's the whole thing at this point. We're post-sideboard, so a D-Spark off the top of the library won't be a surprise to anybody here. And that gives Matt oh, the wow. answer for the Skargan Hellkite, and now he found Cast Down. So now he's, he's got clean answers to both the Grow Chamber Guardian and the Skargan Hellkite. So Ashley does need to find an additional threat this coming turn because, oh, okay. No, no that one's bricked. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> he did eventually Ixalan's Binding. I just assumed, well, I mean, given that this is number three, I just assumed all the, many of the Phoenixes were gone. But yes, yeah. Ixalan's Binding has text, folks. It yeah. doesn't just remove a creature. It does. And it depends on, you know, where you're sitting. But I, since we're sitting in Muffin Pastry Price seat, seat, it has extremely annoying text. Right, very <laughs> annoying. play my card. Hardly fair. Yeah, Matt Nass now firmly in the driver's seat here. Yeah, he's cruising now. Again, leaning on Search for Escanta, turning into Escanta the Sunken Ruin there so many turns ago, but he's been able to really maneuver this game so that he can get maximum activations on that, and that has powered him through. If he didn't have a consistent card draw engine like that, he would have been dead a long time ago. But of course, that's why you play that card. Yep. And again, Ashley running out the 4-4, knowing about Oath of Kaya in Matt Nass's hand. Yeah, this is, I guess, easy mode here for Ashley at this point, because what are you going to do, not play your card, right? Right, exactly. Like, here's the thing. Yeah, and at this point, it's, uh, you know, very close to kind of running through the motions here. Right. Matt is just too far ahead on cards. Look at his hand. He's got Lyra, Kaya's Wrath, Cry to Carnarium, and even firing off a duress just to make sure. Yeah, and I, I don't know if you caught that there, uh, but Ashley kind of did the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, know, I know how this goes. <laughs> <laughs> Been here before. There she is. Yeah, there's a Lyra Dawnbringer to finish up here. That's a land off the top of the library, and now we're in the, you know, the real question is how much more can Muffin Pastry Pie take? It looks like she's... Uh, just about cooked here. Yeah, I'd probably give it maybe two more draw steps. Okay. Yeah, that's a good line. Yeah. Lyra, of course, a big problem for this deck just full stop, let right. alone the, the way that she closes out the game very quickly. Well, it looks like Matt missed here. Oh, the Brick City? Uh, no. Brick City. All right. Excellent timing. And we might just see Oath of Kai here and then 
Matt Ness bouncing it with Teferi Time Raveler here. Yeah. Had that life what a little bit. What has happened to our world, you know? <laughs> Shota and Matt are just burning people out. With <laughs> well, you, you, with, Esper uh, Burn is a new archetype. You haven't heard of it? <laughs> no, I didn't know. I mean, it. I know the metagame's been shifting pretty quickly, but... Yeah, we, we must have mislabeled it on our uh, pre-show documentation. I do want to see Shota just burn somebody out with Bolas of Citadel. Mm -hmm. I've done that, though, not instructed. <laughs> Yeah, and, th and this should lock it up oh, yeah. now. Madness will be able to cast that Thought Erasure at instant speed, thanks to Teferi Time Raveler's plus one ability, and take whatever threat Ashley will draw on the following turn. She should scoop in response. Yep. You don't want to necessarily show. Well, whatever. Gonna ride this one. There we go. All right, so game number two goes to Matt Nass. It was a good one. Real close in the middle part of the game there. Haymakers, jabs being thrown back and forth by our players. But ultimately, again, that game really did come down to, uh, as Kent of the Sun can ruin, just powering the late game there for Matt Nass. So game number three, any tweaks here from Muffin Pastry Pie? Looks like she's consulting her sideboard. Yeah, interesting. I, I kind of like Dire Fleet Daredevil just as a way to kind of get your opponent's thought erasures or what have you. It's, mm. it's just a reasonable thing that you can that can often get you two cards. Uh, Thrashing Brontodon is a consideration because we saw that Ixalan's binding, so you might want that as well. Um, yeah, if there's something that's mediocre that you right. prefer to, to replace. You know, what, one common thing that, that you do against decks with lots of sweepers is kind of board out all your mana creatures. Yeah, I saw that she left all four Llanowar Elves right. in there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it makes more sense, especially if you're on the play specifically, sure. because then you can just kind of get that explosive draw where you go Llanowar Elf into Legion War Boss and just have that run away with the game. But, uh, you know, that is something that you will see. Like, even on the draw, I can see something where you're like, hey, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to put enough pressure to finish off my opponent in time, so I just don't want the land off in my deck. Oof, this is kind of a rough draw yeah. here for Ashley. I, I wonder if that's a, a mulligan there. Uh, the fight with fire is a contingency plan against Lyra. Of course, the Immortal Sun is very powerful, but oh, hello. That, <laughs> that, 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 was, that was the perfect draw because, <laughs> yeah, that, that, the hand was a bit sketchy. I think it was a little too reactive. Just if, if, your, play, if your first play of the game is turn three Domri, right. I think that Matt would take that you know, in a heartbeat. Yeah, and let's let's see what Matt goes for here. I think Domri and the Immortal Sun are yep. the are the two cards to look at. Probably the Domri is pretty far away from the Immortal Sun. I mean, he's gonna have to deal with it at some point. Mm -hmm. He does have Exelon's Binding to deal with it if he needs. It makes sense to take the the more early threat here, though. You know, sometimes these uh, these games do come down to well, what do I care about ultimately? Right, like right, right. It's not about. It's just about if I take away your three Immortal Suns, I can win or whatever. Right. But of course, the Gruul deck has plenty of threats that allow yeah. you to win, so you don't need to just get the Immortal Sun. I mean, the, the one thing, though, about the, taking the Domri is, you know, it's a thing that you can do on curve, but of course, Ashley just has the ability to just adapt the Growth Chamber Guardian next turn by playing land number three. Right. Yeah, that Growth Chamber Guardian off the top of the library was very, very nice huge, for Ashley. Yeah, huge. that put her right back into this game. And there we go. GCG is going to get activated. Finds a friend, and bang, hits you for four. So nice turn regardless, even with Domri hitting the bin. Yeah, and I think we're going to see a tempo play here from Matt Ness to Fairy Time Raveler just bouncing Grow Chamber Guardian. He just wants this, that, this game to get to the late game. And he does have an Ixalan's Binding for the Grow Chamber Guardian, so if Ashley doesn't run out double Grow Chamber Guardian, he can kind of strand the one copy in her hand. That is interesting, right? Because if you look over at the, the is she gonna keep one in hand? That, you know, it's you're like, I don't want to get Kaya's Wrath out oh, of this game. Okay. And look at that. A little bit of a reprieve here for Matt Nass, just facing down the one Growth Chamber Guardian, and that one cannot be activated. So if he fires oh, off the Ixalan's Binding, he'll strand the other one in hand. He will, but you know, there is also that Immortal Sun that he knows about, and yeah. I know he's thinking, all right, it, is it worth it? Because, you know, I'm going to get that two for one here, but Ashley just is just two turns away from casting the Immortal Sun, and my hand is just full of Planeswalkers. Yeah, so yeah, M Matt Nass valuing that Ixalan's Binding and, and knowing that he absolutely that needs idea. to find an answer to the Immortal Sun. If he had something like a D-Spark, mm -hmm. I definitely think he would have fired off that Ixalan's Binding. But since he doesn't, he needs to save it. I don't know. That was an act of cowardice, right? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. This is a Mythic Championship. Let's put it on the line. Right. Well, you know what? It's going to pay off. Look at this. I mean, yeah. Ashley drew a second copy of the Immortal Sun here. Yeah. Obviously, Matt Nass made the right play. <laughs> 
Yeah, interesting turn here. You might see Matt just do it again with the Teferi. Or is he going to go with the Ixalan's Binding? Okay, this is interesting, though, because now Ashley can just tap out next turn and slam yeah. the Immortal Sun. And yes. Matt doesn't have an answer. No, he doesn't. And Narset can't help him find it. And Teferi doesn't do anything. Wow. Whoa. We're going to okay. see the Immortal Sun, which Matt knew about. And he is going to be praying to the Magic Gods for some help. What, and what? he finds a Godless Shrine. Yeah, but now there's a... Oh, okay, so the Narset will shut off the... The extra card. Sure. It will shut off the extra card, but it still pumps your team, makes your spells cost one less. Totally. Okay. He needs to find an answer. He does. He definitely does. Like, she will be casting creatures here. Right. Yeah, I mean, he needs to find one quick. These Planeswalkers in hand are not doing him any favors. Suppose that's how it was meant to happen. Planeswalkers and lands we might in hand see a, for Matt Nass. How close are we to just a fight with fire for 10 damage to the face? It only costs 9 mana. So it would be 8 with the Immortal Sun. That's right. So that's next turn. <laughs> that is next turn. So if... And wait, that's actually lethal then. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, plus 10. Right. So it just needs <laughs> a land. A land will be a fight with fire for 10, followed by the attacks from the Legion War Boss. Ooh, Gruul Spellbreaker. That's cheaper too. Yeah, I, I can see Gruul Spellbreaker getting in as well. I don't think this is quite lethal. We want to give this one haste. Yeah. This is a lot of damage coming in at Matt Nass here. Absolutely. And so keep in mind, Matt, Matt was very aware of this. You know, he knew yes. about the Immortal Suns, and he it was it was a calculated risk. He was thinking, yes. okay, you know, I know you're not going to be able to draw those additional cards off the Immortal Sun. I want to just make sure you can't chain all these Growth Chamber Guardians yeah. well, uh, and, and die to those cards. Now it's like Kaya's Wrath or Bust, and it's a hollowed fountain off the top of the library. Bunch of blanks in hand here, and Muffin Pastry Pie with that sideboard plan of adding in even more copies of the Immortal Sun gets the job done. Wow, fantastic work there from Muffin Pastry Pie. That's going to wrap things up here for round number three here for the Mythic Championship here in Vegas. We'll be back with more right after this. I'm Alexander Hain. I'm from Canada and member of the MPL. When I really got into magic was college. Both my parents come from an academic background, so for them, success in school was was number one. They didn't really understand. And then Saturday night of the Pro Tour, my mom got to meet me and the team at the the event and ended up winning, and it was quite something. Since then, she's gone like full blown fan of magic. My name is Carlos Romão. I'm former 2002 World Champion. I remember when I won my first invite to the Pro Tour, told my father, okay, so this is a professional magic tournament. My father was like, you take like A grades on the school and then you can go. My family was always supportive since the beginning. Like without them, I wouldn't be able to be here. When I got the call, I heard, okay, so we're gonna sign you a contract. And I told my father, and he was so excited. I remember that my mother picked up the phone and said, oh, congratulations, blah, blah, blah. Without them, I couldn't achieve anything like from this game. My name is Eric Froelich. I'm in the Magic Pro League and the Magic Pro Tour Hall of Fame. It just so happened that my entire fifth grade class really just started getting into magic. I wanted to go to the local game store. Uh, I went with my dad and we bought a nice little starter kit at the time. My dad ended up reading the entire rule book, teaching me how to play, and I played with my classmates. I ended up finding myself winning and winning and advancing all the way to the top eight and qualifying for the Pro Tour at 13 years old. And at that point, I was just fully immersed and wanting to go to every major tournament around me. And that's what I did. I was lucky enough to have really supportive parents who found a way to make sure everything I needed to go to, I was there. I'm John Rolfe from Omaha, Nebraska. I've been playing Magic for about 15 years. I played Pro Tour Ixalan, which I thought was gonna be my last Pro Tour, and I ended up top fouring the whole thing. And so then it gave me this awesome opportunity, and I've always wanted to pursue this, why not take a chance? 
and I just kept winning and now we're here, so. <laughs> when I got the call to join the MPL, at first I was just shocked. I had to think about it for a really long time and Magic had been such a big part of my life that I had to at least see where the future goes. I mean, I didn't want to live with any regrets. happy with his opening hand. My name is Piotr Głogowski. I live in Poland, Poznań. I have been playing Magic since return to Ravnica before uh, joining the Magic Pro League. I have been streaming MTGO. I hope that uh, with the advent of the MPL and uh, Magic Arena, I can expand on that. I'm certainly not going to leave the older formats that I love in the dust. Draw two, discard two, and straight into the concession. Wow. Reed Duke equal. My name's Reed Duke. I'm a longtime professional Magic player, and I'm a member of the inaugural Magic Pro League this year. My uh, older brother Ian and I learned to play together, and I've started taking it real seriously once I was uh, around college age, and I've been a pro for about six or seven years. Declare my attack, says Reed Duke. Autumn says, you got it, and scoops up. I come from a tremendously supportive family, and my mother and I sort of have this joke that I'll come home, and she'll say, I was the tournament, and I'll say, Oh, well, I lost in the finals, or she'll say, well, you're still a winner to me. Hey, everybody, welcome back to coverage of Mythic Championship 3, Marie Ritholdi and Day 9 here at the news desk. And it's really awesome because the cream is starting to rise to the top, Day 9. And some players are 3-0 and right now in our tournament. And, and I'm really excited to see the variety that's already showing up in the top three. We got some Is It Phoenix, we got some interesting Simic ramp action from Mr. Simon. Awesome stuff. And, of course, there's Esper Control. All right, one of our players currently sitting at 3-0 and oh is none other than MPL member Jessica Estefan, and she's with Becca. Hey there, I'm standing here with Jessica Estefan, one of the newest members of the MPL, who's currently going 3-0 and oh with her Is It Phoenix deck. Uh, tell me how that last game went for you. My last match was uh, pretty incredible. Um, game one was super interesting, game two was a landslide, and game three was, was another landslide that happened to end in my favor. Um, it's not my favorite matchup to be against, but I'm very happy to have come out with a win in that one. Tell us about who the matchup was and what you were playing against. So I played Is It Phoenix versus Sultai Dreadhorde, and uh, some wild growth walkers got out of hand in game two. So what you're saying is, with this Is It Phoenix, you've got to get out in front fast and you sort of know quickly whether or not it's, the game is going to go in your favor? One of my favorite things about this deck is that it can play a long game, um, but generally speaking, the way that a game is going to play out is going to be determined in the first five to six turns. Uh, so you can just see the writing on the wall, which is sometimes good, sometimes less good. How are you feeling against the metagame overall? I was very happy with my deck choice going into this because I wasn't going to be playing Esper and that seems to be the most popular deck this weekend. Um, so I'm very happy with my deck choice. I'm not confident with all of my matchups, but I'm just going to do my best and see what happens. Now you are one of the few people who submitted a name with your deck, uh, Please Win. What was that about? Uh, so when I was building my arena decks for this tournament, I was losing a lot. And when I put the Phoenix deck together, I said, please win, because I just wanted to win some games of Magic. And when I submitted it, Esports was like, do you want to keep the name? I'm like, yeah, I just I, I should keep winning with it. So please win. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to do anything to mess with your luck at that point. Just keep the name. Jessica, it's such a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks so much, Becca. Thanks so much. Awesome stuff. I love that Is It Phoenix deck, Day 9. It's so cool. It's really fun to play because you wind up, oh, I'm not doing anything this turn, not doing anything this turn, and then you have a full board. Yeah. And you can swing for 15 out of beautiful. nowhere. Attack face. Mm. Chef's kiss. Perfect. All right, we've got some more highlights for you here. We're going to take a look at the match between Carlos Ramau and Eric Froelich, both these players coming into this round at 2 and 0, oh, Esper Control versus Bant Ramp. Now, Bant Ramp is the type of deck that has started to crop up, not due to Esper Control being popular, but due to Esper Hero in the last few weeks. And that card right there, Kaya's Wrath, is the reason a lot of ramp decks have been showing up. Kaya's Wrath was not as popular a week and a half ago, but now that we're seeing Carlos from out and many other players come with Esper Control, it's winding up being quite strong, but there's just so much power in these ramp decks with the high-end card, the Hydroid Crisis we see coming out, Nissa who shakes the world back in the hand, and you can start to run out of answers, which is what we're seeing out of Carlos from out. but of course, Command the Dread Horde is the type of thing that just gets you back into the game 
out of the blue. I love this command, the Dread Horde here, because Carlos Ramal was way behind the eight ball uh, versus Eric Froelich's Bant Ramp deck. Oh my gosh, and at one health, look at Carlos Ramal, man, playing with fire. I mean, at this point, a single point of damage to the face is going to be death for Carlos. So Eric is going to continue to apply pressure with Nissa, who shakes the world. How is the block going to be set up for Carlos? He's going to have to block with both. But the forest is the one that stays alive, so of course Lanawar Elf can come on down. Yeah, Lanawar Elf sometimes all you need when your opponent's at one. <laughs> yeah, and I, re I really love that Carlos is doing this. Just making Eric <laughs> Froelich go through the motions. And this is such a great bluff to do when you're live. Even if you've completely lost, it's great. You want to make sure your opponent... Make them have it. Give them the opportunity to make the mistake. So Absolutely. post board, look at what Froelich has put into the deck. We see Ixalan's Binding, the Immortal Sun. All of the win conditions for Carlos are rooted in those Planeswalkers. Here comes Jade Light Ranger for Eric Froelich hitting the battlefield. Ooh, let's see a Hydroid Crassus. That's a nice one. You know, I just love the way that a lot of these Bant Ram deck feels. You just have such high card quality. Yeah, Duress comes down, but what are you going to get rid of? Nissa, Immortal Sun, Ixalan's Binding? You start burning through your answers quickly. We see a pair of Kaya's Wraths there. Not really going to be very effective against these two essential cards. Yeah, and Krasis, already, already drawing you cards, already gaining you life. If it goes to the graveyard, hey, you've already gotten some value. There's Teferi, Hero of Dominaria. So right now, Eric Froelich in the following turn is going to have a huge follow-up, either Ixalan's Binding or Immortal Sun. Carlos Ramau knows it, and oh, the land falls, and that is just <laughs> Ooh, spicy, excruciating. Now, it, Carlos is not out of the woods yet, or excuse me, is not out of the game yet. Carlos can find D Spark, which is a pretty essential answer. Mortifies have been disappearing due to the just focus on decks that Mortifies bad against. So we're starting to see zero or one copies run in almost all the Esper decks here. Immortal Sun does get picked off somehow. I was looking straight at you, Maria. De I don't know how it died. Spark. De Spark. De I'm so it's glad. It's done so much work this weekend. I did it in advance, and there it comes down. But again, time after time after time, we see that these non-Esper decks are running cards where every single creature, every single Planeswalker that they draw is a game-ending threat. And yeah, there's another De Here Spark we go again. to take it out. It's just so flexible it's in the so format. so good. Yeah. If I had a card of the day, I'm already going to call it D Spark. Ooh, how about Liliana here? There are not many Esper decks running Liliana. And here we see yet another obnoxious threat, a Johnny Adversary of Tyrants. I mean, you know, getting a 1 1 is not the biggest thing. Okay, in case you didn't, <laughs> hadn't heard of this card before, it's called D Spark. Third one of the game. Nice. Not bad. And every single card in this Bant Ramp deck, especially post board, like half of them have an X on it. But this is where Narset has just huge value, denying the Hydroid Crisis the capability of drawing. Once the search for his Kanta winds up flipping, Ugh. Kaya's Wrath followed by Command the Dread Horde. Maybe Carlos will tease us by going down to one health again. And <laughs> Eric Froelich just going to hit Concede here. So we're going to tie things up. Yeah, and I, I think that that last card that was drawn is a pretty essential tidbit. Tristani Discordant can function as an excellent answer to Command the Dread Horde. You yoink all my stuff out of the graveyard and put it out? Great, I'll just take it right on back. I really wish the card just said yoink on it. Yeah, right. Here's Cast Down taking down that Paradise Druid from Eric Froelich. Oh my gosh, this is a beautiful opening sequence from Carlos. Being able to eliminate the Paradise Druid to prevent Lyra from landing on turn four, and then Thought Erasuring her, and now following up with the Fairy Hero of Dominaria. This is the exact kind of opening you want out of these Esper control situations. Ooh, <laughs> lip search wow. for Kanta. I mean, this is... This is a nightmare situation for This Frolic. could not have gone better. Oh, yeah. absolutely. And just three lands in hand. Yeah, Eric's got to not feel great about this right here. Meanwhile, Ifro is becoming quite the land baron. No Narset out, luckily. Hydroid Crisis, the perfect top deck for situations like this. Lanor Elves, once again, is the most agonizing card to have in a green deck. You get a turn one, feels good. Get a turn six, seven, feels, feels quite bad. Teferi Time Ravely here just showing off, too, bouncing that back to hand. Yeah, and all, all in hand, Incubation Druid Lanowar Elves for Frolic is just not great here at this point of the game. Now, one thing to note, though, is that this can be a very uncomfortable situation for, for the Esper control deck of Carlos Ramal. Yeah, Hydroid Krasis desperately bouncing now to try to buy time for more answers. There's the cast down in hand. Oh, there's Liliana Dreadhorde General. Nice! finally going to be able to build up some momentum. I mean, sure, Esper decks have a lot of card power, but Esper decks can run out of answer, and in one turn, the momentum flips. 
Fortunately, not in this case. All Carlos right. Ramau coming out on top. There we go. Carlos Ramau taking down that match. And it's time to take a look at some standings to find where our players are at in this tournament. Taking a look there, Carlos Ramau. We just saw him take down Eric Froelich. Currently sitting at 3-0. Jessica Estefan, we heard from her just a little while ago. 3-0. Simon Gertz in my pick to take it down. Currently sitting at 3-0. Brush off my shoulders there. Shota Yasaoka, Kentaro Yamamoto, our Japanese players at 3-0. Ashley Espinosa, also 3-0, along with Greg Orange at 3-0, my Minneapolis friend there. And Matthias Leverado at 3-0. Those are your undefeated players here at Mythic Championship 3. All right, day nine and Cedric, you're going to tell us about our next feature match. Ah, uh, yes, it is the Strategy gamer, former StarCraft player, and now Magic competitor Jeffrey Brucey. The streamer show is going up against a name that doesn't matter when you've played Magic, you'll probably recognize it. It's Kai Buddha. Uh, he does okay at Magic, I guess. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I guess uh, has won uh, has won quite a quite a few matches in his day. Though this whole uh, this whole arena thing is kind of new to him. You know? Yeah. You know he's learning he's learning a little bit more about this program. You know we had a fun feature with Kai where he talked about you know he won many years ago. He hasn't played that much, and you can see that with the lifetime arena games that have been played with Kai, uh, as opposed to Jeffrey, where Jeffrey's got over ten thousand, and Kai's working his way towards two thousand. Yeah. But I imagine Kai's probably got over two thousand matches actually won in his career. Yeah. Th th there's some really key numbers, some key disparities that we see here, Cedric. First of all, Sho has played 10,000 games yeah. on Magic the Gathering Arena, most of them streamed. And I'll note that this is something that uh, Sho is very, very well known for in his competitive history, not just with Magic, but also with StarCraft. He puts in the hours, yeah. and there is there's really no other way to replace experience other than by just grinding through it. And, and I think that's kind of rare to see someone who's that dedicated to be playing that much. No, that's definitely his MO right now is he's getting yeah. in a lot of the games right now and playing a lot of the games, so I imagine he's very well versed in this format. What'll be interesting is the matchup that's coming in front of us, Esper Control versus Esper Hero. This yeah. is a matchup we're going to see a ton of today, tomorrow, and probably on Sunday as well, and the reason that players have elected Sean to go towards Esper Control as opposed to Esper Hero is because you have a good matchup against Esper Hero. We'll see if things will play out that way over the course of these couple of games that we're going right. to watch, but those Kai's Rats, man, they're pretty much in force here this weekend in Las Vegas. Yeah, so, you know, there, there's a second thing I, I sort of want to ask about that I really feel like the story of this tournament is Esper Hero was doing very, very well mm -hmm. in the last few weeks. It has placed first in some tournaments. And really, you know, if I had to define the core of Esper Hero, it's look at this card quality. Every single card can go off and do big things. Yep. Hero, uh, or the hero itself, being able to continue to grow and grow and grow and grow. Every time you cast a multicolored spell, it summons a 1-1, one, one, and almost all the spells in the deck wind up being multicolored. Yep. You have the Bell Haunted Basilica to be able to not just follow up with some mid-range aggression, but it shuts down a lot of aggro decks, specifically Mono Red. is super, super good against. And then there's 11 Planeswalkers just kind of hiding in the deck, waiting to follow up. Yep. So with that deck being so popular, why is it that Esper Control wound up being the deck of choice? Well, the reason for that is pretty simple, truth be told. These are very, very similar mm -hmm. decks. However, where Esper Hero is playing Hero of Precinct 1 and it's some additional creatures, Esper Control says, I'm going to take out those creatures. I'm going to play removal spells, most yeah. of which will be sweepers, so that basically your creatures are obsolete. We're kind of doing the same thing, but for every bad creature you draw, I'm going to have a better chance of drawing more relevant cards over the course of the game and in our sideboard games as well, and that kind of gives you an advantage. At the end of the day, what Esper Hero is is a good stuff deck. It means that all of its cards are good. They are all powerful right, right. just on their own, and some of them work well together. You mentioned Hero of Precinct 1 alongside multicolored creatures and multicolored spells. We know that. You know, that's kind of the synergy of the deck. But ultimately, this is just yeah. my card's awesome, my card's awesome. <laughs> I hope to draw more of them yeah. than you do. And I'm really interested to see exactly what Show's breakdown in his deck is. He tends to be a very greedy player with a lot of his constructions. Let's head to Becca to get the match underway. Thanks, J9. All right, we're ready for our first player to come onto the stage, the Mythic Invitational competitor. You know him from streaming from Stockholm, Sweden. 